Hello everyone, I'm Bill Harris and this is Life Questions. We're happy to have you join us today for a frank discussion on the issues of life with biblical solutions. As always, we received and reviewed your questions about uh, life and we have passed them on to local ministers who've been doing research on them. And they are here today armed with their research. And we want to get started now by asking them how they uh, feel about the questions that you've sent us. But first, let's meet them. We are joined by Randy Davis, pastor of the Bridge Church, Lima, Ohio, followed by Pastor John Berger of Transform Church, also of Lima. And then there's Pastor Jason Goss of Wapak Church in Wapakoneta. And rounding off our panel today is Pastor Darwin uh, Hartman, he is a local pastor in the Lima area. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you all here. We've got some juicy questions for you to get going with today. I'd like to start with this question that came in. A Pew Research study released uh, just last month suggests that Christians could be in the minority in the United States by the year 2070. As of 2020, 64 Americans identified as Christians but according to trends, the study suggests that the number of Christians would be declining to only 46%. That is from 64 to 46% by the year 2070. So what do you think is the future of um, the Christian faith based on that, that, that trend? Anybody? Go ahead, Pastor. Christians have been in the minority many times over the centuries, even a persecuted minority. However, Jesus said that he was going to build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. That mm -hmm. is why 2,000 years after its inception, Christianity is still strong. We have the awesome privilege, the great opportunity to partner with him in this kingdom endeavor. And I think it is our responsibility, not just as pastors, but as believers to pass that on wherever we go. But I think sometimes we forget our most important ministry is right at home. Uh, the psalmist talks about it several times. Asaph in Psalm 78 says, um, he has established a testimony in Jacob and has appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them. Our greatest responsibility is sharing the gospel, sharing Christianity and the benefits of Christianity with our children and nurturing that until they come to faith in Jesus Christ and then discipling them that they may, when they are older, do the same with their children mm -hmm. and continue mm -hmm. that on from generation to generation. And ultimately that doesn't just stay with the family, but that branches out. What do you think might make for such a study then that would show the Christianity yeah. is gonna be Well, you know, the waning. truth is in so many areas of leadership in America, uh, we're already in the minority. I mean, we're not, we're not leading uh, our country based on a uh, evangelical perspective from the most part. Everything's pushing more and more against what we would believe as mm -hmm. Christians. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the challenge for us is we're not making disciples. And Matthew 28, 19 says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We need to make disciples that make disciples that make disciples and create multiplication. And we're not because discipleship mm -hmm. takes time. Yeah. If I want to grow in my faith, I'm going to have to learn how to read the Bible, study the Bible. I'm going to have to learn how to pray. I'm going to have to, somebody's going to have to come alongside me, put their arm around me and say, come on, Randy, let's go. You want to grow in Christ? I'll walk with you. We barely get people to come to church for an hour a week, much less anything else that can help them grow in their faith. So if Christians aren't growing in their faith, we're not being nurtured. I mean, it's great that John's got a great plan but it's not happening. Yeah. You know, kids aren't spending time with their parents talking about biblical things. They're talking about sports yeah. and homework yeah. and, and everything else in the world. Are you making a distinction between a convert yes. and a disciple? Well, and, and, and the, the challenge is, is we, we look at so many times, uh, we're, we're preaching the gospel, we're getting people saved, we're making converts, but we're not making disciples. And there's a huge difference. I can get somebody to pray the prayer, but can I get them to walk the walk? There's a big difference. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not to judge people. It's just many people have prayed a prayer, but they've never been taught what's next. Mm -hmm. Start in the book of John. Read. What did Jesus do? Follow his example, you know, and or follow me as I follow Christ. Yeah. That's gone. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at my church much. I don't think it's happening anywhere. Uh, if you've ever been to the ocean, we would say the ocean is salty, right? Yes. Okay. Do you know the ocean is only 3% salt? Oh, so really? there, the, the, I'll throw two of these. All right. So one... 
I'm not really worried about the percentage because even at 3%, you should be able to tell that there's Christ in the nation. Absolutely. Okay, so there, that, that should be done. And the other thing is, well, if it's 3% is all take, then are we really being that effective? Because if you look at our country, do we really see Christ being seen in our nation? So is it even 3%? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think one of the things that we err on is that we have all of these great programs in-house in the church. And I'm not anti-church programs, I'm a pastor. Mm -hmm. However, we say if you do this and you attend this and you complete this, then you're discipled. However, I don't see that as the biblical model. Paul would say, follow me as I follow Christ. So one of the things that keeps coming up is that we're too busy to be part of this process. And the discipleship process is lifelong. You may receive a certificate or something in a church for completing something, but the discipleship process is a lifelong process, and that's why we need each other. That's why we have to do life together, mm -hmm. because iron sharpens iron, yeah. and some of it is practical, some of it is the head knowledge that we need, but it has to be both together. Yeah. That's, so that's the Western Sorry. culture yeah. where we check the box. Absolutely. I went to church, check the box. Mm -hmm. yeah. Read my Bible, check the box. Yeah. Rather than, hey, I have to live this all the time, every day, every hour, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Pastor Hartman, what would you say? Well, I'm thinking about it from a little different angle. Uh, I'm wondering why is it like this? Uh, and I think perhaps part of it is that we, the church has taken on a stance of trying to be cultural, culturally relevant. Mm -hmm. And that has led to the diminishing of discipleship. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to me that the two aren't the same track. The culture, the culture is overwhelming. I think we're the, the yeah, right. perhaps mm -hmm. trying to be relevant. Mm -hmm. We have become accommodationist in our approach. Mm -hmm. So we water down those things that might step on our toes, that might, not, that, that might distinguish us from the culture. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we, uh, we kind of try to accommodate perhaps, and we, we do look for decisions and then we assume that if a prayer is prayed, kind of a formulaic yeah. entry into Christianity, but is the Holy Spirit really there? Yeah. And if the Spirit's present, then it seems like life change ought to begin at that point. You know, so. what I've noticed too, is some young people who, who, don't, who don't have uh, enough Bible training and uh, Bible study experience and the like, tend to think that many of the things that we practice in Christianity are traditional and that that's why we are outdated and outmoded and this is why these things need to go away without understanding the true value mm. and i know in i i think that sometimes in society we continue to, we make mistakes sometimes because we abandon those things of the yeah. past yeah. without knowing how they came about in the first place a lot of times there was something went wrong way in the past that led to those kinds of practices we have now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we, well, we, we, tend we don't like to wait for anything in our society. No. Right. You know, just make me a disciple. You know, yeah. wave your magic wand, do it, whatever you got to say, that whatever prayer, and, and all of a sudden I'm a disciple. That's not how it works. I mean, a disciple takes years, decades. It's, it's not something you just automatically become. Yeah. Right. The life of a disciple is really a life of surrender uh, to a different Lord. You know, uh, the life that is unsurrendered submits to self. The life that's surrendered submits to a different Lord. Yes. And that's a, uh, that's a, a, that's a, a discipline uh, that takes a long, long time. Yeah. It doesn't come I natural. I think, too, the, the challenge, Bill, for, for the regular pastor, and you were, you were touching on it, you know, you're, you're doing your best to keep people coming. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if there's these marginal topics that aren't really marginal, <laughs> but our culture makes it marginal, a, a pastor's looking out there and going, and they don't mean to, I don't think. I don't think it's intentional. Mm -hmm. But if I say this, he's not going to like this because I know he's doing it. Yeah, everybody knows he's doing it. Yeah. So I'm not going to touch on that today. Now, it's subtle, but over time, we quit preaching the whole truth. And, uh, you know, nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. and, and, we, and as you said, we make it comfortable. And I had a guy challenge me one time. He said, uh, are you preaching to make people come back or as if they never will? Ooh, that's what a question. question. That's a good question. And he goes, because uh, some people here are one and out. He goes, this may be the only message. And that's how I treat my funerals. And yeah. I'm pretty straightforward because 
I'm never going to get to preach to that person again. Yeah. Yeah. But if you got one shot, what would you tell them? Yeah. And I think if pastors, we'd go into every Sunday yeah. thinking, I'm not just getting trying to get you to come back. I'm trying to make sure you, if you never did, you will have heard the truth. And that's a, that's a, that's a tough challenge, and I've taken that to heart and uh, try to make that my lifelong mission. Yeah, that's, that's, worth, that's very heavy because for some it makes the difference between um, e e eternal life and eternal damnation. That's it, that's it. Yeah. So depending on how they accept it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know we're coming up on break. And uh, when we come back though, however, I want to get into another question. I, I want to ask about tithing. There's, there's some questions we have here about tithing. And it says, should we give all to the local church? So we want to Talk about have done that, that before the break. They're yeah. not coming back. Yeah, now. Not. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're going to come back because they want to hear what you've got to say. We'll be right back with that question right after this. Stay with us. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. Thank you for staying with us. And we have a, a very good question here to start segment two. Do you have to give all your tithes to a local church or can you give it to a variety of organizations? What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I like the question. Um, the good is they have an understanding of tithing. Hopefully a tithe is 10% of, you know, I had a conversation with a loved one here not a couple years ago, and, and he was really hungry to know how to do this. And so he asked me the question very honestly. He said, so this tithing, let me understand it. I said, well, tell me what you know. He said, 100 bucks come in, I give the church 10. I said, yep. 1,000 bucks comes in, I give the church 100. I said, yeah. He goes, but some months I make 10,000, what do I do then? <laughs> I said, a thousand goes to the church. I said, it's 10, still the same still percentage. The same percentage. And he looked at me and he says, does it work? And I said, well, let me read you a scripture. And it's Malachi 3.10. There you go. It says, bring in the whole tithe. It doesn't say anything about divided tithe, which is what they're asking. Yeah. The whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And so I said, test him. Because it goes on to say, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. The, the challenge here is, first of all, you gotta understand what a tithe is. Mm -hmm. And if it's 10%, it should go to your local storehouse. Doesn't mean you can't give over and above to a preacher on TV mm -hmm. or a ministry in town like sure. WTLW. Yeah. But if you start dividing your tithe uh, and, and you say, I have more than one storehouse. I don't know where that stands in this scripture. I, I can't see the validity of it. I had an aunt that wanted to take half of her tithe when I was a young preacher, and wasn't making much money. And she says, me and my husband, which was my uncle, we want to give you half of our tithe every month to help support you and your wife. I said, you can't do that. And she goes, you can't tell me what to do. I said, I won't take it. She said, why not? I said, you won't be blessed. You should give all your tithe to your local storehouse because that's who's going to feed you. That's who's going to come see you in the hospital. Not the TV preacher. Not me. I'm, I'm 12 hours away. She said, I never thought about it that way. And, and she said, they learned that day it all should go to their local church yeah. and that God has blessed them with more than enough to bless sure. others. And they did bless us. But they didn't divide their tithe. And I, I just, I don't, I don't see it in there. I just you read can't. the words whole tithe. Didn't whole you tithe. See, that's, whole tithe. They didn't say 8%. Mm -hmm. Tithe is 10 What's your storehouse? Some people say, well, I only watch TV on, you know, preachers. So they send their whole tithe there. I'm telling you, the TV preacher ain't going to come preach your funeral. He's not going to come see you when you're sick in the hospital. He's not going to come to your house and serve you communion. Mm -hmm. So who's your local storehouse? And, you know, we, we were talking a little bit earlier before, you know, talking about this question. It's a little awkward when pastors talk about tithing. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. it assumes we're getting something from that. Yep. Um, I used to sell cars with Tom all here in town. And I remember one month I didn't make, I didn't sell enough cars to get a paycheck. I got zero deposit and I'll never forget Mr. All coming. And he's one of the most humble men in the world. And he reaches over to hand me my zero paycheck stub. And he says, are you going to be okay? And I said, yes, sir. He looks at me and goes, you're pretty positive. I said, listen, Tom, I'm going to tell you something. 
you're my employer, but you are not my provider. And I'm going to let him figure it out. Wow. And he looked mm -hmm. at me and he goes, you believe that, don't you? I said, Tom, if I didn't, I couldn't work for you. Because this is a faith-based <laughs> business. If yeah. you don't sell, so you don't eat. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I and I if if we say it but we don't practice it, what good are we? And and I told him, I said, Tom, I didn't miss my house payment. I didn't miss a car payment. Yet I had zero deposit from my income from my work of employment, and yet God provided. How does that happen? Except he said, test me this. Even in the tough times. Now I tell people sometimes you'll give that tithe the first time, and maybe you guys have seen this. The washer breaks down. The car breaks down. Somebody gets sick. It ain't always an increase. My loved one that we had the discussion the next month, he, he got a $7,000 bonus. He goes, man, this works. <laughs> and I cautioned him real quick now, hey, next month, <laughs> the car may break down. You may, you know, and he goes, well, yeah, I can see how that. I said, you just got to trust the Lord. Mm -hmm. When you put it in his hands mm -hmm. and his blessings over it, you're covered. If you do it any other way. You're removing God's hand off of your finances. Don't do that. And, and you do some financial stuff. Sure, and, and we were sure. talking about how many scriptures deal with money? Money. 2,300 scriptures in the Old and New Testament. And in the New Testament alone, there is more said about money than heaven and hell combined. Yes. Yeah. You know? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> and, and why do you think that is? I mean, why is it that money is such a big issue that I don't want to give 10% to my local church? What's the battle? Show me your checkbook, show me your calendar, and I'll tell you where your priorities are. It's just part of... We are. I, I had a conversation with somebody. Well, uh, tithing is part of the law. It's part of the Old Testament. Well, no, actually, tithing was cool. before the law was ever introduced. So it was a part of just yeah. this is how you are mm -hmm. to live. Mm -hmm. And so it, because money has such deep roots, we tend to trust money. Money's my provider. Money is what? No, God's my provider. Mm -hmm. God is the one I trust, not money. Yeah. The objective in tithing isn't to receive greater. The, the, the objective in tithing is to, is to recognize the, the giver. Yes. And uh, so if we get that out of whack, then we're going to start coveting what belongs to him and uh, want to go that route. I would say uh, uh, this question here is about giving to the local church. So it assumes a local fellowship of believers, not a TV preacher somewhere. Uh, so it assumes that there's a local body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think that's essential because the local church is where that person's name as a citizen of heaven is registered on earth. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to, pro to provide for that local body of Christ that is a, an outpost of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also necessary that that person support the local pastor who is their under shepherd. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that pastor is worthy of his wages. So I think it's, it's an essential to do that. Yeah. I never tithe until the Sunday after I got married, and that will be here in a couple of weeks, 25 years. And just my own personal testimony, I've kept extensive spreadsheets for years of my finances. And I don't know how many different years that I've, at the end of the year, I show my wife the finances, yes. or lack thereof, but we've never been late on a payment, we've never missed a payment, and we've always had more than enough. Mm -hmm. We've seen God's hand of blessing on vehicles, on children, on everything you can imagine. He promises to bless us, and I think we just assume it's going to be money. Well, we're gonna get money back, we're gonna be rich like the guy on television. Listen, when, when you give everything to Jesus, which is really what the New Testament is all about, dying to self and, and surrendering everything to him, he blesses you in ways that you could never fathom. And, and the tithe is an act of worship, but it also represents that. We're, we're willing to surrender it to God. It's the only place in the scripture where God says, test me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that. For God to say, this area is where I want you to test me, yeah. that's a big thing. Yeah. When I was a youth pastor, I think we've all, a lot of us have been a youth pastors in the day. Mm -hmm. I was a youth pastor, and I would always ask the question, what's the number one stressor in your house? That was the question I asked. Now, I asked it in different ways, but that was the ultimate question. Every kid, every year, every state for 15 years, but one said money. If, what do your parents argue about? Money. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest stress in your house? Money. 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 The kids are stressed out over it because we're stressed out over it. If you just handle your money God's way, test him in this. Mm -hmm. And when you see the extra that comes in or the covering that it gives you in many areas of your life because you're doing it right, it, it's an amazing thing. And uh, 
you know, it, it, you can't explain it. You have to experience it. It's like so much of living out your discipled life is sure. you're, you're not trying to test God in this, but you're taking a step of faith, hoping that the fruit will follow. That's what this is. And, and like you said, because he says, test me, man, just, just try it. What do you got to lose? Mm -hmm. uh, I had a pastor friend of mine. He said, I give people a three month money back guarantee. <laughs> really? That's what he said. He that said, you do it for, you do it three months. And he said, if you come and ask me for your money back, I'll give it to you. He said, I've never had one person ever ask for it back. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, is it because they're embarrassed? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, it's, hopefully it's because it's truth. It's going to happen. It, God's going to bless you. You know, for 40 years, Israel walked in the wilderness. Their clothes didn't wear out and all that. Now, I don't know if you have the same shoes you had 40 years ago. <laughs> but probably, I mean, you know, if styles never changed, it didn't matter really because what was needed was given and provided mm -hmm. in abundance. So. That's the, that's the principle of tithing, it yeah. seems to me. I, I remember being in a, <clears throat> in, a, um, in a worship service, rather a prayer service, as a teenager, 16 years of age. I had gotten saved when I was 15, the Lord saved me. And at 16, my pastor said, the Lord told me to tell you that if you will give him one dime out of every dollar, he will bless you. And so I started doing that out of my allowance. And then when I got a job, I began to do it that way as well. And Look at me now. I've never lost a meal. I've never left, a, you know, missed a meal. That's for sure. And uh, I've just seen in so many areas how God's blessings have come back. And I don't mean to put it on the receiving end in, in the regard that I'm giving to get, to get back. I don't mean it in that regard. It's just that so many people who uh, are against tithing and criticize it always say, well, listen, what do you do about the person that's in lack and they don't have enough money? You, know, you don't make, you don't embarrass them because they're not paying the tithe. You don't do that or try to force them. But even if they give out of what little they have, like the woman, the woman with the widow's might, as the right. Bible calls right. it, she will still see it out of God's economy yeah. that He will bless. Tri tithing allows you to, you're actually acting on the very character and nature of who God is, because God is preeminent, which means He is first. And so tithing says, it's the first fruits. I trust God first above mm -hmm. all else. Mm -hmm. And if you really think about it, Jesus is God's tithe. Mm -hmm. Je Jesus is the firstborn yeah. and yeah. he gives yeah. it to us so that he, we are redeemed. Yeah. And so it's not like just God came up with this thing. No, God actually said, hey, I'm going to give a tithe and I'm going to pay it for all of you. Mm -hmm. Very well put. Very well put. You know, one of my most embarrassing moments as a teenager growing up, my mom and dad got divorced when I was 15 and... And mom had never so been in the, when I said yeah, yeah. And mom had never been in the workforce. And it wasn't even a year in. And you know, we'd gone from being a kind of an affluent family and dad was very successful and had a lot of stuff. Didn't realize it because we weren't spoiled. We had to work for everything we did. Mm -hmm. But uh, we got to the point it was just me and mom one day and I came home and she says, You might want to go to your aunt's house to eat dinner. And I'm like, Why? She goes, Buddy, we don't have anything. Hmm. I'm like, Whatever, mom. So I go looking. We're out of peanut butter. We're out of bread. There's no bologna. I mean, we always had bologna and cheese, you know, <laughs> little mayo, and there was nothing. And I was embarrassed. Like, wow, we're poor, Mom, you know. And uh, about 10 minutes later, knock on the door. Here comes my pastor with five bags of groceries. Mm. I was embarrassed. Yeah. I was angry. I was like, no, man, we, we, don't, we don't take handouts. We give them, you know, because mm -hmm. like, that's what my whole family had been. But it was the first time God told me. This is me taking care of you because your mom's done it right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though your end of the month ran out, we didn't have groceries. Yeah. And I wasn't about to go to my aunt's house now. Now, normally I would because she cooked pretty good food, but I couldn't. Like, and, and God showed me that that's his provision, that he used my local church to help me and my mom in a desperate time and brought us groceries. Mm -hmm. I, and again, never happened again. Thank God. Because I think he knew, he saw my heart, man. I can't take this. I can't, I, I'm not good at receiving. I'm way better at giving, you know. But it was a, it was a tough time as a kid. But I know it was God's protection because mm -hmm. my mom had tied. My mom had put the Lord first. And, and yet we had to receive. Yeah. When you place yourself under God's economic principles in his economy, he becomes your Jehovah Jireh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. And, and he does have an economy. He does. Mm -hmm. And uh, even the cattle on a thousand hills is his. I mean, it, it, it's all his. Oh, yeah. And um, so if we'll just be open to that, yeah, we'll be blessed. Now, here, look, look at another question here. Um, I'm trying to get God's clarity on a situation, and a friend of mine told me, put out a fleece. What does it mean to put out a fleece? 
Any idea about that? Well, so yeah. the, the ref references to Judges chapter 6, and it's talking about Gideon. Mm -hmm. um, and Gideon tests, God, are you really telling me to do something? Um, I'm going to argue, and, and you guys might disagree. I don't, that's not really necessary for us today. Because the Holy Spirit did not work as he did in the Old Testament as he does in the New Testament. Right. I now have the Holy Spirit that that's I can it. ask exactly. God and go to him directly yeah. Yeah, and right. have that conversation. Right. The Bible says that if I need wisdom, I ask. Mm -hmm. That he is right there. And mm -hmm. so... Um, I understand the, the idea of putting out the fleece, but you know what? I can have this conversation right now. God, do you want me to do this? And I always tell people, if you want to honor God and your heart is, I want to I wanna follow God, then if you ask God, hey, God, if I make, I make this decision, will you give me peace? If you have peace, move forward. If mm -hmm. you don't have peace, don't move forward. Right, right. And just like God can give you a sense of peace on what he wants you to do, he can also give you a sense of disturbance yeah. when he doesn't want you to go there. And, and, and in fact, mm -hmm. I, I, I feel in my spirit sometimes, I, 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 don't, don't go there, don't go there. Yeah. And I just have to back off of it. Because Instead of putting a fleece, find somebody you trust to tell you the truth. There you go. And go to them and say, hey, I'm thinking so-and-so, what do you think? Yeah. Let's pray about it for a little while. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Just don't get in a hurry. It'll yeah. never go good if you get in a hurry. That's mm -hmm. right, yeah. Put it on the back burner. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I like King Hezekiah's approach. You know, when he... Uh, Make it quick, because we're just about out of time. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure I can. Uh, <laughs> King Hezekiah laid his this threat he had out in front of the Lord. He says, look here at this. I've got a problem. And... Um, he, he sought the Lord's help right mm -hmm. there. And I mean, there's more to be said about that and how we might do that as believers because the answers will come. We don't yeah. always recognize yeah. them. Yeah. And uh, so that's the reason for the fleece question. Probably we don't quite understand, so we want the fleece, right? Yeah, all right. So let's, let's do this. Let's pick up on the same question on next week's program. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll do that. We'll, we'll kick in on that one. Well, we thank you for being with us today and uh, certainly hope you'll tune in again to hear more about putting out a fleece versus following the Spirit of God. So until next week at the same time, I'm Bill Harris for These Fine Ministers. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.